Despite a decade of gangland murders and allegations of links to police, Victoria repeatedly resisted following the lead of other states in setting up a state anti-corruption commission. Last month, the Brumby government did a backflip of sorts, promising it would eventually establish its own version of a state corruption watchdog sometime in the next few years. But the model, say critics, falls far short of other successful bodies across the country. Deborah Cornwall reports. For more than two decades, corruption watchdogs have been frog marching police, public servants, even premiers into the witness box. Hello, darling. God bless you. Firstly, I don't know of any corruption in the police force. It was the landmark Fitzgerald inquiry in Queensland that first set the benchmark, exposing corruption that went all the way to the top. Guilty on all counts of corruption. Corrupt conduct is generally speaking conduct engaged in by consenting adults behind closed doors. Gerald Cripps spent five years as Commissioner of the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. <laughs> A job, he says, would have been virtually impossible without the formidable powers to compel witnesses and dig deep into people's private lives. Hello, possum. What are you doing, Georgie Porgy? You got another job that I'm going to string out for a couple of months? It is very interesting to observe that, for example, the major big inquiries ICAC entered into when I was the commissioner what emerged would never have hit the light of day if it hadn't been for an institution like ICAC. In the 21st century, a strong anti-corruption body is an essential element of a modern representative democracy. Like Queensland and New South Wales before them, Western Australia went through the pain of a royal commission before setting up its own corruption watchdog six years ago, the Corruption and Crime Commission. I felt sick to my core. And... In its short history, the Triple C has already claimed a number of high-profile careers, including government ministers and senior bureaucrats. The Triple C thought it would make its reputation by claiming my scalp. The recent collapse of the Triple C's five-year inquiry and the former Premier-turned-lobbyist Brian Burke has prompted fresh controversy over its extraordinary powers and the lack of natural justice for the accused. It does tend to strike terror into the hearts of a lot of people, uh, young and old, who are asked to go down there. As a lawyer who's used to going to court and representing people where you afford a due process, natural justice, you're about as much used to your client as an old auntie holding their hand at the dentist. Anti-corruption advocates say howls of protests over show trials and star chambers come with the territory when you take on the powerful. But while the West Australian government is currently reviewing the powers of the Triple C, there's a general consensus, even among criminal lawyers, that it's better to have some kind of corruption watchdog than none at all. I think the Triple C in Western Australia has been remarkably successful. It stopped those lobbyists in their tracks from uh, the corrosive effect that they were having on due process in government, in my view. But it's not just confined to the lobbyists. We've had a whole raft of police officers, public servants, who have been um, brought to task. Former West Australian Attorney General Jim McGinty says... In all, 700 people have been prosecuted by the Triple C so far, but the real measure of its success has been the wholesale changes in the way business is now conducted. It's about changing a culture which tolerates corruption. Mark Legrand, a former member of the National Crime Authority, says the scandal now engulfing the Victorian Brumby government is perhaps the starkest demonstration of all of what can happen in the absence of an effective anti-corruption body. The two men shot dead in the front seat were believed to be... Well he was gunned down as he attempted to leave his car. Despite a decade-long gangland war, the Brumby government has repeatedly refused to call a royal commission. But with at least four out of 37 murders linked to police, the Garden State, it seems, is now more famous for its cartoon gangsters 
and crooked cops. In many ways, uh, Victoria, there seems to be a time warp. They seem to have uh, remained in the 70s. Some of his police members may be involved in gangland murders. I mean, it doesn't get more serious than that. There seems to be this view that Victoria really doesn't have a problem. I mean, if that isn't a problem, what is a problem? Critics of the Brumby government say rather than taking any serious measures to deal with police corruption, it has instead appealed to Victorians' vanity, assuring voters that while Victoria might have some problems, they still aren't nearly as bad as the other states. Victoria um, has been saying for years that it is probably the cleanest state, uh, the one with the most integrity. The Victorians do think of themselves to perhaps be that little bit um, more ethical, a little bit more genteel. Um, yeah. There is an element of that, but it takes something like a royal commission to show that really it, it's not factual at all. It was the same mantra invoked yet again last month when the Brumby government announced it planned to set up its own version of an anti-corruption commission, following a review by former senior Kennet bureaucrat Elizabeth Proust. But there was no pressing urgency. We think this is a unique, unique opportunity to create an integrity and anti-corruption body without that major scandal looming in the background. Impossible for me to understand how Proust could say that. Victoria is now an extremely corrupt state simply because no one has ever done anything about corruption for many decades. Anti-corruption advocates say the Prowse model falls so far short of what's needed, it largely defeats the purpose of a corruption watchdog, especially the extraordinary proposal to conduct most inquiries other than police behind closed doors. One of the least attractive uh, aspects of some other jurisdictions is the, uh, the public circus that, that occurs and the reputational damage uh, for a very small percentage of people who actually end up going through the courts and being charged. In point of fact, just about every public inquiry I engaged in seriously damaged the reputation of someone, but that was justified because that someone, I believed, had engaged in corrupt conduct. Victoria should get some credit for trying to move forward to have an organisation that deals with corruption. My problem about it is I don't think it is really going to work. It's now 35 years since the Victorian Beach Inquiry into Police Corruption, an inquiry with limited powers and underwhelming results. The number of police were charged, but that was the good old days. Uh, you could hardly get evidence against them and they were all acquitted. Corruption has built up and become systemic. And by that I mean is that if you're a police officer, you know if you behave corruptly, no one will ever be looking at you. Uh, and it, they become careless, they become dangerous. With an election due in November, Premier John Brumby is now at least talking about the need to do something. And it is my view, our government's view, that the time is right for the next wave of reforms to drive integrity in our state. While other states have been steadily recasting themselves as models of good governance, Victoria, it seems, is stuck in underbelly mode. Now, it's not perfect, and those organisations are not perfect, but it's a heck of a lot better than having no real uh, body to, to go to or, or having this facade. Without them, we'd be in a really perilous situation. And yeah, look at Victoria writ large.